Warning, the following video contains bad language and is only recommended for ages 13 and over. Viewer discretion is advised. And Brian, what do you want people to know now, now that these pages, this investigation, all these investigations have been released, what do you want the public to know about it? Very interesting, Robin, in all of these pages, hundreds of pages, many, many hours of investigation going to the Philippines, going to Chicago, going all over the country. There's not one scrap of evidence that Michael Jackson ever harmed a child, did anything wrong, committed any crime. It's almost a vindication when you look at this. The FBI looked at all of these matters and said there's nothing here and I think that's the most startling thing which I've seen. What's up YouTube? This is Speardo21 and I'm not gonna bother doing a lot of talking in this video but instead I'm gonna be showing shit tons of clips that prove that the Leaving Neverland movie about Michael Jackson being a pedo was a big huge fucking lie. I've done loads of deep research on this shitty fake ass movie and I'm here to expose it as being a load of bullshit. First of all, after this fake ass movie came out in 2019, there was this one Michael Jackson biographer who said that the stories that were told by the Michael Jackson accusers, Wade Robson and James Safechuck, didn't add up, and he said that they lied about everything. And I myself even exposed Wade Robson and James Safechuck in my other video proving that MJ was innocent, which that video will be linked in the description down below for the people who haven't seen it yet. But before I get into this video, I just want to say that I know I don't need to make this video because I already showed crap tons of real actual proof that Michael Jackson was innocent in my other video. But the reason why I wanted to make this video is because I've seen some retards who've said that Leaving Neverland proved that Michael Jackson was a pedophile when it actually didn't. And lots of the people who saw the movie also said that it was a bunch of lies. And here is the mother effing proof of that. There have been no shortage of sensational allegations aired in the Leaving Neverland documentary, but now bombshell claims from a former Michael Jackson biographer are threatening to discredit the film. Mike Smallcomb has pulled apart key facts, including dates that don't add up. For many fans, leaving Neverland has left little doubt in their minds about the King of Pop. He helped me with my career, he helped me with my creativity, with all of those sorts of things. And he also sexually abused me for seven years. But now a former Jackson biographer is challenging the accuracy of the film. Mike Smallcomb says claims by James Safechuck that the abuse happened at Neverland train station between 1988 and 1992 could not be true because it wasn't built until two years later. He confronted director Dan Reed on Twitter who admitted the mistake. There seems to be no doubt about the station date. The date they have wrong is the end of the abuse. He continues to stand by the film and the alleged victim, saying James was at Neverland before and after the construction of the train station. He was abused by Jackson in multiple places over many years. But that's not the only discrepancy. The biographer also questioned Wade Robson's claim that he was molested at Neverland in 1990 while his family were at the Grand Canyon. Wade's mother has previously testified that the whole family was on the trip away. Biographer and journalist Mike Smallcomb joins us now. Thanks for your time. Look, have a few dates just been mixed up or do you reckon James and Wade are lying about it all? I can't say for sure that James, Safechuck and Wade Robson are lying about the entire thing. Um, you know, 
I can't say that for sure, but what I can say is that at least three aspects uh, of the allegations that are featured in that documentary are provably uh, untrue. Um, we've heard a couple of the bits that you've mentioned, um, the train station one with James Safechuck being uh, the big one. Uh, obviously, he uh, alleges that the abuse went from 1988 to 1992, and it can actually be proven that, um, well, he, t he said during the documentary that he was abused at the Neverland train station. He went into great detail about how it happened um, in a room upstairs in that train station. It wasn't just a fleeting comment in that documentary, it was, you know, it was a, a big part of it. And it can be now proven through documents, through photos, that that train station didn't open until uh, mid-1994. So that's a real two-year discrepancy there. Um, and it's not just a case of dates being mixed up. Uh, Michael Jackson spent the whole year of uh, 1994 living in New York City um, to get away from Santa Barbara because of the allegations and the DA going after him and also to record an album um, in New York. Uh, he moved there because of an earthquake as well. He was a bit scared to uh, record in the LA area, but the point is that by the time Safechuck would have been at Neverland again, he would have been 17 or 18 years old. Mm. So that mm -hmm. changes the entire narrative that that film is um, trying to give us, that Jackson you know, lost interest in young boys when they hit puberty, and of course that Safechuck himself said that uh, the abuse ended when he was 14. So it's not, it's not just a small matter, you know, it mm. changes the entire narrative of that whole documentary. It's a big, big deal. Well, and when you hear... And in the case of Wade Robson, of course, it's... Yeah, when you hear these things yeah. about dates not lining up, then you do... There is a bit of doubt that creeps into your mind about what the story is here in these historical cases. Um, the documentary's director, Dan Reid, pretty quickly admitted the mistake with the dates. Did that surprise you that he didn't put up more of a fight on this? Um, it surprised me that he did it on Twitter in the way that he did, um, just a fleeting reply to me. Um, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's just crazy that he did it on Twitter, but okay. it didn't surprise me because there's, there's, um, there's, it's undeniable, um, you know, he, he can't yeah. deny that you know, there's a big discrepancy there, so yeah. of course... Um, he had no option but to uh, agree that the dates were wrong. Yeah. So it did surprise me, and it didn't it surprise me the way he did it. You but, were, um, you wrote, yeah, you, you wrote the biography it. of Michael Jackson. Did you come yeah. across any evidence of sexual abuse? Uh, I didn't know, right. and I've never come across anything that would make me believe that he did these things. Okay. Um, I can't say for sure that he's innocent, of course, but um, I'd like to believe that he is, and I've certainly never seen any hard, cold, hard evidence to suggest okay. that he's ever done anything like that Terrific. throughout the years. And Michael Jackson's family was even asked about leaving Neverland, which I already showed this clip in my other video about Michael Jackson being innocent. But I'll just go ahead and show it again. First on CBS This Morning, Michael Jackson's family, they are speaking out about sexual abuse allegations against the singer in an explosive new HBO documentary. In Leaving Neverland, Wade Robson and James Safechuck claim Jackson abused them for years when they were young children. The documentary premieres this weekend. Jackson has always denied any inappropriate behavior with children. Safechuck and Robson both sued the Jackson estate, but their lawsuits were dismissed because of the statute of limitations. They are now appealing that. The Jackson family insists those claims are lies. We spoke to Michael Jackson's nephew, Taj, and brothers Jackie, Marlon, and Tito. I take this interview very, very seriously because it is very disturbing to me. And that's why I did want to talk to this child psychologist who's an expert. And she said, it, it is extremely rare for teenage boys to make false claims of inappropriate sexual conduct against a man in particular. Unless you're Michael Jackson. Wade Robson met Michael Jackson when he was five. James Safechuck filmed a commercial with Jackson just before he turned nine. Both say that for years, the pop icon invited them to his homes and molested them, accusations the Jackson family vehemently denies. One thing that struck me that Wade said, he calls Michael Jackson one of the most kindest, gentle, loving, caring people, person he knows, who helped him creatively, but also sexually abused him from the ages of 7 to 14. 
Do any of you think that both can be true? Michael helped him in, in, in what he wanted to do in, with videos and music from, the, from that side of things. But uh, if Neverland was uh, so horrifying for him, and uh, why would you keep going back? None of us in this room were there at the time that these allegations were made. So how can you say what they're saying are lies? No, we weren't there, and, and nobody was there. But uh, the facts are a public record. I mean, would he testify under oath of all the different things that he said? Those are the facts. In the past, both men have said that Jackson never harmed them. In 1993, Safechuck gave a statement to police for a molestation case involving another boy. No criminal charges were filed. In 2005, when Jackson faced criminal charges, Robson took the stand. His testimony is often credited with helping Jackson win in court. Wade and James both say, Wade in particular has admitted, yes, I lied on the stand. Yes, I lied under oath. Yes, I lied to my parents. Yes, I lied to everyone I cared about because I wanted to protect Michael. He did not want to be the one, in his words, that harmed Michael Jackson. Do you not believe him when he says that? I do not believe him when he says that because we know our brother. Michael wouldn't do anything like that. And then he waits until after the passing of Michael, 10 years later, to come out and state this. And he's, they're still in court with the, with the estate, suing them for hundreds of millions of dollars. But Michael's not here to defend himself. Mm -hmm. So you think the only reason they're doing it is because Michael is no longer here? Yeah. And you, you don't buy that they, they wanted to protect him and that's why no, under oh, no, life? No, no, no. no. Well, Wade's never that. protected anyone yeah. in his life. Does the whole family feel this way? I've, I've seen the comments from the brothers, but I haven't heard anything from your sisters. I mean, everybody everybody the same thing that you were saying? About this. Of course. I, I think there's a fear as well to put more energy to it and more eyeballs to it. Yeah. I think that's why my Aunt Janet hasn't said anything because she doesn't want to make it any bigger. Why do you think they're coming forward now? Money. You think it's all about money? Well, it's all about money. It's always been about money. <laughs> I hate to say it when it's, a, when it's my uncle. It's almost like they see a blank check. And they, and because they've been taken care of their whole life. And, and I think that's the problem. These people are feel, felt that they're owed something. You know, instead of working for something, they blame everything on my uncle. Some would say there's a lot at stake financially for the Jackson family as well. No. Yeah. Uh, we get we don't get anything from this thing. emotionally, this, but not, emotionally, not I mean, what's, yeah. Yeah. Though the Jacksons haven't seen the documentary and say they will never watch it, they take issue with filmmaker Dan Reed, who they say never reached out to the family for their side of the story. So he took what they were saying face value as, as to be true, but he, I, he trusted them, but which is nothing wrong with that, but you must verify. Because when you start uh, throwing allegations out about someone, then you gotta go back and go, wait a minute, let me make sure I'm telling the right thing. Make sure they're not selling me a bunch of goods, which, which they were. What do you want to say about your brother as this documentary is about to hit the country? I want them to understand and know that uh, this documentary is not telling the truth. Uh, there, there has not been not one piece of evidence that corroborates their story, uh, and they're not interested in doing that. Some would say, though, guys, it's hard for you to sit here and say the documentary isn't telling the truth when you haven't seen the documentary. Shouldn't well, you see the documentary, Jackie? I don't Jackie? care to say no, because I know my brother. I don't have to see the documentary. I know Michael. I'm the oldest brother. I know my brother. I know what he stood for, what he was all about, bringing the world together, making kids happy. And he was never, in your opinion, abusive to children? No, never. Never, never. never inappropriate with children? Never. Never. Never in a sexual way? No, 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 in a sexual never. way. The people never. that really know him, they know the truth, too. Yeah, they were very adamant, as you see. They said that over and over and over again. And even asked different ways about Michael. They all go back to, we know him. The world doesn't know him the way we know him, and he would never, ever hurt a child, which is what Michael Jackson used to say all the time. And, and look, I understand as a family, they want to defend and protect him, but one thing that stood out to me watching the documentary is how alone Michael Jackson seemed, mm -hmm. right? You didn't see the family around mm -hmm. him. In fact, he viewed these boys as family, mm -hmm. so th that, that doesn't necessarily work with what they're saying. Yeah. That he had a very complicated family. relationship with his family, and, mm -hmm. and when you see the documentary, you will see he felt very close to strangers who you would think didn't know him as well as his family did. It's a very interesting dynamic all the way around, but they are very adamant about this. Michael Jackson did not do this. This is about money, and their brother is not here to defend himself. And here's some more proof that leaving Neverland was a bunch of fake-ass bullshit.
looking at Exhibit 579. Um, the statement that you wrote was, Michael Jackson changed the world, and more personally, my life forever. He is the reason I dance, the reason I make music, and one of the main reasons I believe in the pure goodness of humankind. He has been a close friend of mine for 20 years. His music, his movement, his personal words of inspiration and encouragement, and his unconditional love will live inside of me forever. I will miss him immeasurably, but I know that he is now at peace and enchanting the heavens with a melody and a moonwalk. I love you, Michael. Is that right? That's what I wrote, yeah. Wade Robson, who met Michael Jackson when he was five years old after winning a dance contest in Australia. For decades, he never missed a chance to refer to himself as a close friend of the pop star, someone who was his mentor and largely responsible for Robson's successful career as a dancer, choreographer, and stage director. In this 2016 deposition, never before seen publicly, Robson talks about that glowing tribute he wrote to his longtime friend, Michael Jackson, in the days after the pop superstar died. I love you, Michael. Is that right? That's what I wrote, yeah. But now Wade Robson is singing a different tune. He and another proven liar, James Safechuck, claim they were sexually abused by Michael Jackson as young boys in a one-sided so-called documentary called Leaving Neverland. Everybody wanted to meet Michael or be with Michael. And then he likes you. Critics say Leaving Neverland only has one goal, money. Wade Robson and James Safechuck both swore under oath that Michael Jackson did nothing inappropriate to them. Then, in a failed effort to get rich, they changed their stories to seek a huge, multi-million dollar monetary payday in lawsuits against Jackson's estate and companies. Their lawsuits against the Jackson estate have been dismissed not once, but twice. Nonetheless, they are pending on appeal, so Robson and Safechuck are still holding out hope for a big jackpot and hope this one-sided hit piece leads them to their pot of gold. If there is a potential financial payout of hundreds mm. of millions of dollars, there is an, in there is an incentive. That litigation over the last five years or so has generated many, many hundreds of pages of legal documents in the form of sworn declarations, deposition transcripts, motions, judgments, etc. And anybody who's been following the case and following those documents that's been published will be aware that there are significant problems with these guys' stories. One of them was caught committing perjury uh, in his creditor's claim. So we knew before the film came out that the two protagonists on whose stories it was based had credibility issues. Skeptical media throughout the world are questioning director Dan Reed's agenda in making the film. They see through the litany of one-sided accusations from two known liars who repeatedly spin a salacious drumbeat of alleged sexual abuse while offering not one shred of evidence or independent corroboration to support their stories. Just two accusers who have admitted lying in the past and changed their stories a number of times. So the entire film rests on their word and nothing else. Your journalism has been heavily criticized uh, because you didn't include the opposing points of views in the film. Was that a conscious decision from the get-go? If you're going to be mentioning Michael Jackson, though, don't you have some obligation to get in touch with the people who have his interests, even though he's not here, obviously? Because you're saying and you're repeating some pretty extraordinary things, don't you have an obligation to talk to the family, even if you claim this isn't about him? Well, what does the family know about the sexual abuse that happened? Do you think they know about the sexual abuse? But it, when you're doing it, this is documentary. <clears throat> it is, say, yeah. right? So when you're doing a documentary, don't you have an obligation to at least ask the question? Because you don't know what the answers to questions are until you ask. Well, we know we know that the family and the estates and Jackson during his lifetime and his lawyers all denied that any sexual abuse took place. And those views are strongly represented in the film. Well, I, OK, the guy's dead. Mm. He can't respond to this. He but Wade, Wade Robson and James Safechuck are not dead. Jackson was accused in 2003 by the Santa Barbara County District Attorney, who some said carried out a personal vendetta against Michael Jackson that lasted 
for more than a decade. Well, we haven't ruled anything out. In 2005, Jackson was declared innocent by a jury in a case involving a boy named Gavin Arvizo, one that CNN legal analyst Jeffrey Tubin called an absolute and complete victory for Michael Jackson and an utter humiliation and defeat for the prosecution. Since Leaving Neverland was released, numerous errors, misrepresentations, omissions, and outright falsehoods have been identified in the film, which relies solely on ever-changing stories of Robson and Safechuck. Leaving Neverland is a film that has been shown to include provable lies, conflicting accounts, contradictions, staged reshoots, faked scenes, reconstructed memories, critical information omitted, manipulated news clips, discredited source material, and key motives ignored. Perhaps the most glaring fabrication in Leaving Neverland comes from accuser James Safechuck, who clearly lied in the film by claiming he was sexually abused in the Neverland train station Michael Jackson had built to resemble the one at Disneyland. But there's a big, big problem with this story. A huge discrepancy in the timeline. He says that one of the locations where Michael Jackson was abusing him on a daily basis was the Neverland train station. Right. And he vividly describes the interior of the train station. Now, this version of the story that he tells in the TV show places that abuse in the train station in 1988-89. The train station did not even open until 1994. And as you correctly say, in his sworn declarations, in his ongoing litigation with the estate, he says that Michael Jackson stopped molesting him when he was around 14 years old in 1992 because he got too old for him. Right. And the whole narrative of this film is that Michael Jackson molests boys and then when the boys hit puberty and get too old, he then ditches them and moves on to a younger boy. That's the whole narrative that right. they're selling with this documentary. But when it's revealed that this location where uh, Safechuck is describing his abuse is, it, it did not exist when he was the age he said he was, Dan Reed, the director of the documentary, goes on to Twitter and says, well, there's no dispute about when the train station was built, but what's in dispute is the dates of the abuse. Right. <laughs> so James Safechuck was abused right. it, after, the, after the train station was built. Well, right. firstly, he's now accusing his own star witness of perjury because James Safechuck has signed not one but two sworn declarations in which he states that Michael Jackson never abused him after 1992. Right. So in order to defend his documentary, he's throwing its star witness under the bus mm -hmm. by calling him a perjurer. But also, he's upended the entire narrative of his documentary. Leaving Neverland contradicts the alleged victim's own sworn depositions. In the video, Wade Robson spins a dramatic tale of being left alone in 1990 with Michael Jackson at Neverland. Robson claims that while his family was hundreds of miles away at the Grand Canyon, Michael Jackson abused him for the first time. But that's not the story Robson told in his lawsuit against Jackson's companies or in a deposition under penalty of perjury just months before HBO's cameras began rolling. There, he claims his family was still at Neverland when it first happened, and his sister was sleeping upstairs in Michael's room. Two entirely different versions of events told by Wade Robson, just two months apart. The first night, the night prior, we both slept in the bed with Michael. Mm -hmm. um, and at some point that second night, she said to me, I think we should, you know, you and I should sleep upstairs. I don't know why. Um, I don't know why she said that or why she thought that, but I didn't want to. Um, so yeah, so then I then then when, whenever it was bedtime, you know, she went upstairs and Michael and I stayed in the bed downstairs. And I believe at some point that night the abuse started. So which is it, the version Wade Robson tells in a sworn deposition, or his version in Leaving Neverland? If he changes his story in two months for the cameras. How can you trust him at all? But that's not all. Earlier testimony by Robson and his mother contradict the entire 1990 story told in Leaving Neverland that director Dan Reed uses as a foundation for the film. 
Robson's mother, Joy, testified in 1993 that her son was never alone with Michael Jackson at Neverland until that year. And here she is seen confirming under oath in 2016 that her entire family, husband, parents, and kids, went on the trip to the Grand Canyon. I understand that you stayed then two different weekends at Neverland on that trip, is that right? Yes. And then in between you and your kids and your husband and your parents all went on a tourist trip to the Grand Canyon? Yes. So you were there, is it two nights the first time? Yes. And then you came back after um, your whole family had gone away? Yes. And you spent another, what, two nights? At Neverland, yes. Robson himself testified as an adult that the first time he visited Neverland without his mother was in 1992 or 1993, which means he would not have been alone at Neverland with Michael Jackson in 1990, as Leaving Neverland claims. In other words, Robson and his family over time have told multiple versions of a key story viewers heard in Leaving Neverland. So which is it? The version Joy Robson tells in her deposition or the version Dan Reed presents in Leaving Neverland. James Safechuck's dramatic scene where he claims Michael Jackson gave him jewelry for sex, including an alleged wedding ring, was deceptively staged and edited to appear as one seamless scene when, in fact, it was actually edited together from filming done on two separate occasions 17 months apart and done intentionally to pump up the drama of the scene. You can tell by looking at his clothes, essentially the same in both shots, except he forgot the undershirt the second time around. And look out the window. Clearly different seasons, with the plants trimmed in one shot, but not the other. Once people pointed out the changes, Dan Reed was forced to admit he went back and rented the same Airbnb to recreate and reshoot the scene nearly a year and a half later. Can viewers trust deceptive editing? The staged sequence at the end of Leaving Neverland showing Wade Robson burning Michael Jackson items is misleading to the point of fakery. That's because Robson sold his most valuable Michael Jackson memorabilia in 2011 for nearly $100,000. Needing money, he consigned all items to Julian's auction and tried to remain anonymous. But Julian's auctions wouldn't agree, tweeting, Wade asked to remain anonymous and said that he did not want anyone to know that it was him selling the items in 2011. But we did not agree to that and listed it as the Wade Robson collection. He consigned multiple items and wanted us to sell all items of his that had value. Leaving Neverland fails to mention Wade Robson has been looking to make money by shopping for a lucrative book deal, unsuccessfully, about the allegations in the year prior to his lawsuit. Leaving Neverland also fails to mention that when writing it, Robson could recall so few details in 2012 about his story with Michael Jackson. The same details he remembers with such supposed precision in leaving Neverland that he had to ask his mother by email to help him fill in the blanks. Did you ever ask your mother for any written materials um, to help you write your book? I think along the same lines, but maybe I would ask her, you know, of a, of a certain uh, period of time, you know, could you just jot down the bullet points of what you remember, asking my mother that, you know, of how the details of when we went to the ranch and the first time and, you know, just how did that unfold, the external details. So have your memories changed have you, as you've gone through that process? They've evolved. What do you mean by evolved? Yeah, I mean, not changed in a, in a sort of black to white sense. Like I thought it was this thing. Well, I mean, they have as far as prior to the healing process, right? Prior to disclosing. Um, but post-disclosing the abuse in, in 2012 and beginning that healing journey, they've evolved as far as I remember more details about scenarios as it goes along. You know, it evolves, details get added to 
Wade Robson was one of the witnesses who eagerly testified for Michael Jackson in 2005. Robson and his family claim in Leaving Neverland, it was at a Neverland dinner the night before Robson testified in Michael Jackson's 2005 criminal trial that he became convinced that he needed to lie on the stand the next day to save him. Except, according to Jackson family members, that dinner actually took place after Wade testified. He also claims in the film he had to testify because he was subpoenaed. Then you have his constantly changing story about how he came to testify in 2005 for Michael Jackson's defense, beginning with, I didn't realize I'd been abused, and then morphing into, well, I did know he'd been, I'd been abused, but I didn't want to uh, be responsible for orphaning his children, so I decided to <laughs> testify in his defense, and then morphing into... Uh, I was threatened and bullied by Michael Jackson and his lawyers. So that story keeps changing. There are massive problems with his story, you know, to the point where you could take any one of those issues that I've just listed, and that would be sufficient grounds on which to say, this guy has problems with his story. You cannot believe it beyond a reasonable doubt. But when you add it all together, I mean, it's, it's catastrophically damaging. Jackson's attorney, Tom Messero, who says he doesn't believe Michael Jackson was a molester for five seconds, said Robson never wavered during the trial and how adamant he was that Michael was innocent. He was very, very strong in his defense of Michael Jackson. He told me in no uncertain terms he had not been molested, he had not been abused, and that these claims were ridiculous. I mean, this man was so strongly supportive of Michael Jackson, so powerful in his defense of Michael Jackson, that it just shocks me that he's changed his story in recent years. I just can't get over it. Messero also says Wade Robson's claim in Leaving Neverland that he was subpoenaed and forced to testify in the 2005 trial is simply not true. So does defense investigator Scott Ross. As far as making anybody testify, I, I, would, I would love for uh, Wade Robson to show me the subpoena he never got. When pressed in a deposition, Robson could not provide any specifics about his alleged subpoena. Do you recall being subpoenaed for the criminal testimony in 2005? I do. Do you recall where you were when you were subpoenaed? I don't. Do you recall if you were with anyone when you were subpoenaed? I don't remember how I got the subpoena. This is a transcript of your testimony from the 2005 criminal trial, correct? Um, it appears to be that way. Robson now claims he committed the crime of perjury on the witness stand in 2005, even as skeptics point to the rigorous cross-examination he was subjected to. On line 18, you're asked, Mr. Robson, did Michael Jackson ever molest you at any time? And you said, absolutely not, correct? Correct. And that was a lie, right? That was a lie, yeah. Okay. On line 21, you're asked, Mr. Robson, did Michael Jackson ever touch you in a sexual way? And you responded, never, no, correct? Correct. And that was a lie, correct? That was what I had rehearsed with Michael. And you now claim that that was a lie, correct? That was not the truth, no. Yeah. On line 24, you're asked, Mr. Robson, has Mr. Jackson ever inappropriately touched any part of your body at any time, correct? Correct. And your answer was no, correct? Correct. And you now claim that that was a lie, correct? That was not the truth. Can you turn to page 9100? On line 14, you were asked, and at no time has any sexual contact ever occurred between you and Mr. Jackson, right? Do you see that? Yes. And your answer was never, correct? Yes. And you now claim that that was a lie, correct? That was not the truth. That's why you always, always, always start with your strongest witness. In our case, that was Wade Robson. Wade Robson had to get through three seasoned, experienced, intelligent, attorneys. How is it that when those three attorneys, this was not a surprise attack, those three attorneys were very seasoned, experienced, three attorneys with cross-examination history under their belt, prosecutors, 
got together the night before, prepared their attack. How are they not able to break Wade Robson? If you're trying to hide the truth, you're going to waver, you're going to do whatever. And James Safechuck's claim in leaving Neverland that Jackson pressured him to testify during the trial is provably false because he was eliminated as a witness by the judge well before the trial even began. Leaving Neverland leaves out critical information that seriously calls Wade Robson's story into question. Robson's description of Neverland as an adult was nothing like the House of Horrors he now claims it was. He gushed about how wonderful it was. So we went to the studio where he was recording the Dangerous album at the time, and it's like 89, and um, with the whole family, grandparents and everybody, and, uh, and just hung out for a couple hours and watched videotapes, and then he asked the whole family to come back to the ranch, his place, that night, Neverland, and uh, we ended up staying there for like a week. Um, that must be every kid's dream. I mean, my dream would have been to go there too. Yeah, I mean, you show, it's Disneyland. You know, his house, we show up, it was just the best thing in the world. Wade asked if he and his fiance could be married there while Michael was on trial. Turned down because it was such an inappropriate request at the time. And Robson even shot a short film at Neverland with his wife. And in the credits, thanks Michael Jackson for letting him use his sacred land. Michael Jackson is not going to be abused. Michael Jackson is not going to be slammed, is not going to be a pinata for every person who has financial motives. Another misleading piece in the so-called documentary. A news clip of Mark Garagos, who initially represented Michael in 2003 in the criminal case, is manipulated to appear as if he's threatening an accuser after Michael's arrest. We will land on you like a ton of bricks. We will land on you like a hammer. If you do anything to besmirch this man's reputation, anything to intrude on his privacy in any way that's actionable, we will unleash a legal torrent like you've never seen. In fact, he was talking about a completely different legal case in which he and Michael were secretly videotaped on board a charter aircraft. Disclosed that those two video cameras, which also apparently had audio on them, were surreptitiously placed in there, were recording attorney-client conversations, and then somebody had the unmitigated gall to shop those tapes around the media outlets in order to sell them to the highest bidder. Graphic sexual details, especially in Safe Chuck's story, are similar to details contained in a discredited book by Victor Gutierrez, who Michael Jackson successfully sued for $2.7 million. Leaving Neverland never mentions that Wade Robson literally begged to get a position working with Cirque du Soleil on the Michael Jackson One show in Las Vegas, a job that he badly wanted prior to suing Michael's estate. Uh, a couple of years before the show premiered, Wade sent an email to the creative team at Cirque um, stating, and I quote, I always wanted to do this MJ show badly. He then goes on in this email to say, I know that I am meant to do this show. I am passionate to do this show. I want to make it amazing for me, for you, for Cirque, and of course, for Michael. The gig ended up going to you know, Jamie, Jamie King. King. Jamie King, yes. So obviously he didn't get the gig. Even so, in July of 2011, Wade Robson did an interview stating he was starting work on the show. I'm starting on uh, Cirque du Soleil, Michael Jackson show, which is, uh, you know, exciting and terrifying all at the same time because it's such a huge uh, responsibility. Wade's, you know, changed his story about four different times. I would say that Wade, you know, decided he went to the, our, he went to my uncle's memorial. He did tribute shows left and right for my uncle. The minute he did not get MJ1, he all of a sudden starts writing a book on the down low. No one wanted to buy the book, and then all of a sudden he ha he comes up with these allegations. Leaving Neverland also strongly implies that two other friends of Michael Jackson's, Brett Barnes and actor Macaulay Culkin, were sexually abused. It suggests that other boys were lined up to replace older ones, almost like an assembly line. Yet neither was contacted during the making of the film. Instead of giving them a fair chance to respond to his smears, Reed threw up a sentence on screen for five seconds stating they have consistently denied abuse, seemingly winking at the audience as he does it. Both have always maintained Michael was never inappropriate with them. 
and both testified under oath as adults that nothing untoward happened. Like, we were friends. We were, like, seriously, he was, like, my best friend growing up for, a, like, a good, fat stretch of really? my life. Yeah, yeah. Like, it, it's, it, was, it was legitimate friendship. All I can speak to, really, is, you know, like, the way he was, and, you know, uh, you know, d despite whatever the reasoning was, kind of thing. Yeah. But, no, he liked being around kids. And, and it wasn't odd. No. To you. It was, honestly, it never struck me as odd. I never felt uncomfortable or anything like that. Brett Barnes contacted his lawyers and asked his name and likeness to be removed from the film. HBO refused. And there are even more verifiable lies being spun by leaving Neverland in the promotion of the film. Director Dan Reed states that Robson and Safechuck didn't meet as adults until the Sundance Festival. This is false. According to Robson's 2016 deposition, they spoke in 2014, and their shared legal team was present. Later, it was revealed the meeting occurred in person over lunch. Robson claimed that he was abused hundreds of times. But his deposition and his mother's depositions show that they only spent four occasions at Neverland while Michael was there, between 1991 and 2005. They slept a couple of times at Jackson's condo in Century City. And sometimes other people were there too. And Wade never went on tour with Jackson. So why didn't Wade Robson speak up sooner? In the film, Robson claims he was in love with Jackson, and that was why he did not speak sooner. But that's just one of the many versions he gave. He also says he didn't know it was abuse and was wrong. He thought he would go to jail. He was taught to lie about abuse, but others say it's because now that Michael Jackson is dead, he is an easy target for those who are willing to make up any allegations without risk of being sued for defamation. Every single person who accuses Michael Jackson subsequently goes straight to a civil lawyer and tries to sue him. There is never an accuser who simply walks into a police station and says, Michael Jackson molested me, what are you going to do about it? They always go to a lawyer and say, let's get rich. Did you attend the memorial service for Michael Jackson at the Staples Center? Yeah. Robson's reaction to Michael Jackson's death is telling. In Leaving Neverland, Wade Robson and his family claimed they remembered in detail his being broken up at Michael Jackson's memorial service, even more than at his own father's funeral. It's obviously intended for drama, but just a few months before the HBO cameras rolled in his 2016 deposition, Wade Robson casts doubts on that version. It also showed he was still annoyed he wasn't invited to a private service for family and close friends. Did you cry at the memorial service at the Staples Center? I might have. I don't remember. Were you invited to the private memorial? I don't believe so. Were you upset that you were not invited to the private memorial? Yeah, I was hurt. Why? Because at that point, you know, I still thought that uh, we were, that Michael and I were, you know, were close friends for a very long time, had a long relationship that, uh, you know, that I would have been included in something like that. Actually, he was so eager to exploit his friend's death, he reached out to producers of the primetime show So You Think You Can Dance less than 24 hours after Jackson died to make sure they knew he was available in case the show was planning a tribute. This is an email that you wrote to <coughs> Jeff Thacker on June 26, 2009, correct? Yeah. Is the show that you're referring to in the last second to last sentence or second to last line. And you said, I wanted to write you now, so if you guys are thinking of doing any dance tribute to MJ on the show, I would like it to be me who does it. Do you mm -hmm. see that? Yeah. Is the show so you think you can dance? Yeah, I believe so. Okay. Is Jeff Thacker associated with so you think you can dance? Uh, yeah, he's a, he's a producer. Yeah. It speaks to my compartmentalization at the time. In fact, Wade Robson had nothing but wonderful things to say about Michael Jackson, both while he was living and after he died, when his career was involved. In general, with Michael, um, just had a wonderful relationship. I learned so much from him as an artist and as a kind human being. Um, and it's my goal to try and just continue 
as much as I can in my own little world, that legacy. We talk so much about him as the pop legend, which is important, but it's nice to really remember that he was a man, that he was a father. And that's what it's really about, is the father and his children. And he's a wonderful dad. Are you still friendly with Michael? Yeah, we still talk every couple months, catch up. You yeah. do, really? Yeah. What's he like? What's he like? He's a good guy. He's a good guy? Even after Michael's death, Wade Robson had nothing but praise to offer, including these interviews prior to the emotional 2009 MTV Music Video Awards tribute to Michael Jackson, starring Michael's sister Janet, in which Wade performed as one of her dancers. It's a huge connection between Michael Jackson and MTV and really starting this real music video generation on MTV. I and mean, Michael was really the king of that. So I like all of those connections. And obviously my connection with Michael and all of that coming together is kind of just one of those serendipitous things where all the elements have, have come together. So I'm excited for a lot of reasons to be a part of it. These are uh, Michael's gloves from the Bad Music Video. You know, Michael gave them to me when I was, I don't know, seven or eight. He's going to be with us spiritually, but I wanted to feel something physical from him. So um, I'm probably going to rock one of these tonight, too, when we perform on stage. And just feel that much closer to him. Although Leaving Neverland has been massively discredited, the movie has not had the impact the filmmakers were hoping for. I think what they were hoping for was a response akin to the um, Harvey Weinstein right. response, you know, where all of a sudden you have another person coming out and then another person coming right. out and then another person. And it's just a, this huge snowball that keeps getting bigger and bigger. And in the end, it destroys Michael Jackson. I right. think Dan Reed really thought he was going to win a Pulitzer or something. Right. But in fact, it's just been a complete catastrophe for them because it's not had anything like the impact that they thought it would. There's been like a handful of mm. radio stations in the whole world yeah. who've actually banned the music. And uh, but, you know, like 99.9% .9 are still playing it. Right. And in the meantime, the documentary has been completely discredited online. Um, it's not done anything like the numbers, I think, that they thought it would. And that's pretty much all the proof y'all need to know that Leaving Neverland was fake as fuck and was filled with a bunch of fake ass lies. And... <laughs> Michael Jackson was innocent, and he's always been innocent. So these people who believe all these lies and allegations about him really need to get their heads out of their asses and realize the truth about Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson was a great singer, dancer, and person and he deserves nothing but respect because he's a legend and he's the king of pop and people just really need to shut the hell up with all these fake ass allegations about him like just let the man rest in peace already you heartless motherfuckers i'm gonna get on going for now so so the last thing that i'ma say for this video is Rest in peace to the king of pop, Michael Jackson. Your music and legacy will never die, and you will always be remembered for many decades to come.